So I'd like to do uh, really three things today. The first is just to share with you a sense of excitement. I think what I'm talking about today is sort of fundamentally not about some insight that I've had or something that our team at GiveDirectly has accomplished, but it's about a change in technology that we think has the potential to completely transform the way international philanthropy works. The second thing I'd like to do is to give you a very clear picture of exactly what we do. So I, my hope is that when you leave here tonight, you'll understand what GiveDirectly does better than you understand any other not-for-profit you've ever come across. And the third thing I want to do is to pose some questions. So we think of uh, venues like today as very much part of an ongoing conversation. And I have at the end of my deck some of the questions that are most pressing on my mind. You'll have others. I look forward to talking about all of those. So before I jump into what we do, I want to talk a little bit, almost begin with a calibration exercise, sort of just a step back and think about when we close our eyes and think about the poor, the people we're trying to help in Africa, what image comes to mind. One of the interesting things that I've learned as I've been getting into this nonprofit space is that uh, the way the poor have been portrayed in the United States has changed quite a bit over time. Right? Go back to the 80s, the modal image that we would see as donors in the US would probably be you know, the image of a victim. And fast forward to today, the modal image that we see if you go to a website and think about making a donation might be the image of a microfinance client, right? Somebody with an idea that we might be interested in investing in, someone who's going places. That's kind of interesting, right? There's obviously elements of truth in both of these things. What I'd like to do as we start today is to step back, okay, realize that there are elements of truth to both of these things, but uh, approach the topic with an open mind and be willing to be very data-driven as we form assessments of the poor and how they behave. So with that in mind, let me give you a sketch of how the system that we've built to help these people currently works. So you have here on the left side of the screen a donor, on the right side of the screen a recipient. The donor wants to do something to help the recipient. And implicitly here we've already identified the recipient. And that's, uh, that's actually going to be important because right, a lot of what we do at Give Directly is locate poor people. So we'll be talking a lot about that. But for now, just fix that recipient and think about how resources get from the donor to the recipient. So first, the donor is going to make a contribution to a big international NGO. Let's think about some of the big successful groups that work in this space. Okay, that group is going to use a bit of the money on fundraising, a bit of the money on administration. And then typically, they're going to work with local partners to implement programs. They'll have different priority sectors. They might work in health and education. And when they implement these programs in developing countries, they'll often work with a local NGO that has legs on the ground to get things done. So there will be a range of local partners they work with. These organizations also have some of their own administration costs, some of their own management structure. And then in concert with the international NGO, they're going to make decisions about what goods and services to deliver to the poor. And at the end of the day, what the poor are going to get are going to be the goods and services that these people decide are high return investments. We're going to make that assessment based on different metrics. At some places, it could be a fairly heuristic judgment. In some places, it could be based on very rigorous impact evaluation. But by whatever means we reach that conclusion, we're going to give the poor these things that we think are good. Okay? So in broad strokes, that's the status quo. What do we think about this system? Well, you typically hear people say two things that they're not thrilled about. The first is that it's expensive. Put another way, it's inefficient. Right? Is that true? That's actually really hard to say. When you look at this system, it seems like all of this infrastructure, all the people who get employed, seems like it must cost a lot. Right? It's really hard to say how efficient it is. And I want to walk you through an example to make it very clear why it's hard. I'm going to pick here an organization that spends 90% of its budget on program services. If you've ever been to a charity's web page, you know that in the US, nonprofits report how much they spend on fundraising, on administration, and on program services. And they're required to do that by law. And so this is the, the method that we commonly use to assess how efficient a charity is. Now, the interesting thing about this particular organization, and I'm not naming any names here, but this is a big, well-known group. You would all know who they are if I told you the name, is that they also publish a more detailed auditor's report. And so we can drill into that 90% and get a sense of what goes into it. So about 37% of that includes the following items, salaries and professional fees. Those on, the, on their own are actually about 20, 25% of this. Uh, program development, telecom, postage, shipping, printing, travel, occupancy. So these things may all be very good. Right? The point here is that they're not obviously a measure of benefits created for the poor. Right? These are inputs. These are things the charity buys in the course of doing its business. Right? 
There's another about a third of this, uh, sorry, about 20% of the 90% that uh, goes to other agencies. So I mentioned it's very common to subcontract with local organizations. So we don't really have visibility for that 20% on how it gets used. We just know it goes onto the books of one organization and then off to another organization. That leaves about 33% of the overall budget going to things, commodities and ocean freight, supplies, and other project costs. And let's be charitable and suppose that other project costs are all really fantastic things. This is stuff that you could think about as maybe being a measure of value created for the poor. So the point here isn't that this is necessarily a poorly run charity. Right? These salaries that we're paying to people, that could be a really good investment. Right? We don't know. But the point is that program services is not a measure of efficiency. Right? It doesn't tell us how much benefit we're creating for the poor. It's really just a breakdown of expenditures. So the bottom line here is that we don't really know for sure. And that relates to the second question, the second concern that people have about this sector, which is people often complain about how it's opaque. Right? It's very hard if you go to a typical organization's website to get a clear sense of what exactly they're going to do with a marginal donated dollar. We're big fans of the guys at GiveWell. I see that actually Ellie Hassenfeld from GiveWell is on your schedule. He's going to be here in May, so that's great. You should all go to that talk. Um, Ellie's great. We're big fans of their work and their motivation for getting into this sector was that you know, they found that useful information about what different organizations do and whether it works just isn't publicly available anywhere. And by way of background, what these guys do is call you up and ask a ton of questions. So I'm always on the phone answering questions that Ellie has about what we're doing. And that's great. That's kind of a level of scrutiny that you want to really understand what an organization is doing. So at GiveDirectly, you know, we think we have some of these same concerns. Right? We're not convinced that the way money is getting used is as effective as it could be, and we find it hard to assess what other organizations are doing. We really feel like these are related to a much deeper, much more fundamental feature of the sector. Right? And fundamentally, this is a system that's been built to determine what poor people need and deliver it to them. In other words, it's a paternalistic system. Right? It's built to decide for on people's behalf what would be good for them. And in my view, if you think about a system, if you commit to a system that looks that way, if you start with the premise that poor people aren't capable of making important decisions for themselves, you're inevitably going to end up with a large administration, with people who are making those decisions for them. And you're going to have to pay those people. So that's a choice. And it's not necessarily a bad choice, but it's one that we'd like to assess and look at data and ask, does it really make sense to be spending on this large system? Does the fundamental premise on which it rests hold true in the data? So obviously at GiveDirectly, we think that, uh, that something different is possible and desirable. Right? What we think we could do is instead of the system we have in place right now, right, we think that in the future, international philanthropy or large parts of it could look more like this. We take the donor and we draw a straight line to the recipient. And the reason this is possible is because of new technology, right? the technology I mentioned in opening. It's possible now to send money directly to people who live in extremely remote and very poor parts of the world. This guy's holding up a cell phone. This is one of our recipients in Kenya. He's holding up a cell phone showing a text message that says that he's just received a transfer from GiveDirectly from us. Right? So he'll be able to take this cell phone to his local M-Pesa agent, it's the name of the service we use in Kenya, and collect that money and cash it out by exchanging his e-money with the agent for hard currency. This is happening in Kenya, but as I'll show you in a couple of slides, it's spreading. Right? Kenya is where we went because Kenya is where this technology is the most advanced, but it's coming to other parts of the world. It's spreading very rapidly. So what would be the potential benefits of a system like this relative to the status quo? So the first is efficiency. Right now, we don't really have a sense of how efficient the status quo is. In our approach, we can define efficiency in a very concrete way. What percent of the donated dollar ends up in the hands of the poor person? And our target at Give Directly is to get 90%. Second, transparency. So one drawback of having large organizations that do a lot of different things, it's very difficult to assess, to understand exactly on the margin what's going to happen to your dollar. Right? Our approach at Give Directly is to do one thing and explain very clearly what we're doing with your donated dollar. And as I said before, I hope by the end of the talk that you have no ambiguity at all about what exactly we're doing on the ground in Kenya. And then the third is respect. And this comes back to this very deep structural aspect of the system that I mentioned two slides back. Right? The current system is a system that empowers experts to decide what's best for the poor. And the alternative system that we have in mind is one which empowers the poor to set their own priorities, to decide to determine for themselves what's most important in their lives.
Can I ask a question about the efficiency? Yeah. So what if I had another system that say only had 50% efficiency, but I was raising 100 times more money? So in terms, to me it seems like the total amount delivered could be a metric. <coughs> So what system do you I have? Don't know. I don't have a system. I'm just saying, like, wouldn't that be the proper metric, not percentage of what? So the way I would think about it, I would think about this in terms of the total market. Okay, think about the existing market for philanthropy. Right? There's a certain number of dollars being given. Right. Well, I guess that's what I'm challenging. Is there a certain number? Is maybe the system a there lot of it is no. sucking the money out of the donors? It, 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 there is, right? So the question for a new model is, how is this going to affect equilibrium in the sector? Right. Yeah. One possibility is that people who currently give to existing organizations hate this. And they keep giving to existing organizations. That's fine, right? Mm -hmm. the, only, the only impact we'll have in that case is that we might bring in some people who are skeptics now and aren't giving. And that's great, right? We get some people giving who weren't giving before. Right? Another possibility is that people do switch over. Right? And then we get that extra kick, right? We go from 50 to 90, in your example. Right? Although 50 might be a little harsh. No, no I'm just saying, like, it just seems to me like that the metric you could imagine, it's not fixed how much money is actually the total amount of money getting dumped into the system. It's not a fixed amount. Oh, exactly. But that makes the case even stronger, right? That's exactly the case for having variety and competition, right? Okay. Having different alternatives in the okay. sector. I completely agree. Okay, so this is all great. This is the philosophy, right? The two core questions you want to ask about ideas and development are first, does it work? And second, does it scale? So I want to give you an overview of the data on cash transfers. The first thing to know about the evidence on cash transfers is that there's a lot of it. And people don't always know this, right? So we count in our database at least 21 unconditional cash transfer programs that have had some form of serious evaluation done. And of course, there are many more conditional cash transfers. And these are cash transfer schemes that give you money but make you jump through some hoops to get them first, like your kids have to attend school. Right? Uh, you certainly shouldn't take our word for any of this. So there are other reviews out there, for example, by DFID, which is the English aid agency that I would point you to. You should look to third parties and see what they have to say. Um, but just to give you a sense, right, by way of benchmarking, we have a lot of evidence on cash transfers. We probably have two rigorous studies of microfinance so far that have found somewhat mixed results. Right? A lot of people are surprised to hear that because we think of microfinance as an established thing. Right? Empirically, cash transfers are much better grounded. Right? Second thing to note about this evidence is that cash transfers have been shown to have long-term impacts. The channels through which that works tend to vary quite a bit across contexts. When you talk about the impact of cash transfers, it's very misleading, right? Because the whole point is flexibility. So if we talk about the impact of textbooks on test scores or something like that, we sort of know what we're talking about in different contexts. In cash you know, context, the uh, impacts could be completely different in a different setting. So one thing we often think about when we think about long-term impacts is are people's incomes higher? So in some settings, that has been an impact of cash transfers. We recently got results from a five-year follow-up in Sri Lanka that found that people, who, men who received grants of $100 to $200 were earning $100 to $200 more per year five years after having received the grant. So that's like a massive, that's a 100% annual rate of return on the investment. Right? Interestingly, that was for the men and not for the women in the sample. We'll talk a little bit later on about gender differences. That's uh, a surprise for people who uh, thought that this, this idea of microfinance and targeting microloans to women was a good idea because they had higher rates of return than men because they're traditionally disadvantaged. Uh, another channel is in utero health. So we have recently some evidence from Uruguay. It finds big reductions in low birth weight. Right? So low birth weight is one of the strongest predictors of bad outcomes later on in life, lower earnings, worse health. Right? So babies being born above that low birth weight threshold, that's a, that's a fantastic impact. And an interesting point about that is that's really nutrition, right? That's food for the mom. One thing I found is when you talk to people about the impact of cash, if you say, we find improvements in anthropometrics, children's health, things like that, everybody's really excited. That's great stuff, right? That's long-term impacts on these kids' lives. If you say, you know, people got this money and they spend it on food, they say, well, you know, okay, so what's the point, right? We fed them for a week or a year, but, you know, now what, right? Those are actually the same thing. Right? It kind of highlights the, the importance of drilling in and understanding these mechanisms very carefully. So children's health, I mentioned the low birth weight um, impacts on anthropometrics, like height for age, and on, uh, on cognitive development. Children's education, so it kind of makes sense that these conditional cash transfers would increase school attendance, because you only get paid if you come to school. Unconditional cash transfers also increase school attendance. 
and reduce child labor in a number of studies. The bottom line is that people who have reviewed this evidence, not us, but other people, find it fairly convincing. The other key thing to note about cash transfers, the evidence, is that there isn't evidence of abuse, the kinds of things that we often worry about. And the two big things here are first, effort. Do people stop trying if you give them money? And second, vices. Do people blow the money at the bar? Okay. We should be very frank about the fact that poor people spend a fraction of their budget on things like alcohol and tobacco. Right? That's, that's what the data say. Okay. The data on cash transfers say that when you give people money, they typically spend a proportionate amount. So if they were spending 2 or 3% of their budget before on alcohol and tobacco, they'll spend 2 or 3% on the margin of what they get on alcohol and tobacco. Right? And that is what it is. But there's no evidence that people are disproportionately blowing cash transfers at the bar. The second thing is this effort margin. The data here, there have been some fascinating debates, in fact, on the South African experience with pensions. The bottom line here seems to be that people aren't working less there's some evidence they may be working more because they're able to migrate and take risks in pursuing better jobs in cities when, they, uh, when the household begins to receive a cash transfer. The last thing to know about the evidence is that in light of this, governments have adopted cash transfers on a large scale. This actually surprised me. I knew about programs like Progressa Oportunidades. Best estimate we have is that close to a billion people are currently receiving some kind of cash transfer from their government in developing countries. Uh, in contrast to that, when we started, we couldn't find a single nonprofit that was devoted exclusively to making cash transfers. So now, to the best of our knowledge, we're the only one. And we found that juxtaposition really striking. And that's something I would hold on to and think about as we walk through the rest of the talk. So that's an overview of the evidence. Second question is, will this scale? I mentioned we're doing this in Kenya. Let me tell you a little bit about the growth of M-Pesa in Kenya. This launched in 2007. They had about, what, 200,000 users. They're now up to around 14 million as of last year. That's 32% of Kenyans. Uh, the Gates Foundation recently put out a study estimating that over half of the lowest half of the Kenyan income distribution, the poorest half of Kenyans, have used M-Pesa at some point. Right? We're going to see that when we go out into the field and uh, enroll people for GiveDirectly, they don't have to be current users. They don't even have to have a cell phone. We just have to give them a SIM card and they can participate. So this is an accessible technology even for, for very poor people in Kenya. What about outside of Kenya? So we started there because this seemed like a great place to begin. Well, mobile ownership is booming across the developing world, right? So the basic technological infrastructure that we would need to do this elsewhere has exploded, has grown at a rapid scale, and many, many of these people are previously unbanked. So these are people who are potentially entering the financial system for the first time. And cell phones aren't the only kind of, of branchless banking technology. So CGAP counts around 40, sorry, 70 other branchless banking institutions that have launched in 40 countries since 2007. So there's been an explosion in this technology, and we're really excited now about getting into other markets beyond Kenya. So I'm thinking about going to places like Haiti, the poorest country in our hemisphere. That would be amazing. Or going to a country like India, which probably has the largest concentration of the world's poor today. That would be amazing. So uh, I'd like to tell you next a bit more uh, about what we do. And at this point, I hope you guys will, will start peppering me with questions. And, uh, you know, each of the design decisions I'm going to show you, we put a lot of thought into, and I wouldn't say that any of them was obvious. Right? Many of these you'll look at and say, well, what about this way, or you could have done that. And those are really good questions to ask, you know? so I want to hear those. And I'll try to tell you a little bit about the thinking behind the way, we, uh, the way we do each of these things. So first, a quick look at the team. This is the group that I'm privileged to, uh, to work with. Uh, really a really great group with a strong background in international development, sort of people who have collectively spent a lot of time in the field but also a diverse set of skills across private sector, uh, current private sector occupations. Our process is a, a simple four-step process. So we start with the donation donors give, either through our website or by check. The second thing we do is find poor households in Kenya. We'll spend a bunch of time talking about that process. Third thing we do is transfer donations electronically to the recipient's cell phone. So I'll walk you through the way that, that works and how much it costs. And then finally, recipients use the money to pursue their own goals. It's up to them, entirely up to them, what they want to do with it. Two things I want to highlight about the entire process before jumping into the details. So one is that we do all of this in-house without using subcontractors or local partners. And we feel really strongly about this. There are two reasons. One is that I think it's very difficult to assess the real cost of doing something when it gets split up across multiple organizations. 
And in many cases, you can see a rationale for doing that. You have another organization that has some local expertise or some resources on the ground, so it's tempting. But as a donor, I find it very difficult to assess whether we're getting an accurate picture of how much the activity costs. The second thing is that we really want responsibility and accountability to rest with us. So for example, when I talk about how we decide who gets cash transfers, there are approaches like the one we use where we bear the full burden. We shoulder the responsibility of doing that. There are other approaches in which the community would be more involved or maybe a local power broker would have more of a say. Right? We feel strongly like there will be mistakes made, but we want them to be our mistakes. And we want to be the ones accountable for making those things better. So let me jump into step two. Here's how we locate poor households in Kenya. First, we're going to use census data to locate poor parts of the country. And then within those parts of the country, we're going to select villages that are safe and accessible. And accessible here, the important part is having access to an M-Pesa agent. Right? There is currently a network of around 27,000 agents, so most parts of Kenya do have access to that. But we don't want people taking an inordinately long trip to go and collect their transfers. Right? We're going to send field staff into these targeted villages and we're going to enroll those who live in mud and thatch homes. I'll show you in a second what exactly these homes look like. Yeah. Uh, are you focusing exclusively on, on villages? Do you have any urban programs? You know, we've thought a lot about this. We started in villages. Part of that is because you know, I think the rural poor are really poor. But Kenya is known for, you know, has some of the most notorious slums in the world as well. And we'd be really excited about going there too. And I think the cost of locating poor people in an urban slum will be lower than the cost I'm going to show you today because the travel costs are such a big part of it. I think that's a great point. We're going to enroll people who live in a mud and thatch home and we're going to give uh, each of these recipients a SIM card and ask them to register for M-Pesa. This decision, this mud and thatch home thing, is a super important one. And to give you a little bit of context for this, broadly speaking, there are two approaches to targeting poor people in developing countries. One is called a proxy means test. It means you choose a set of relatively observable characteristics like these and you give money or give whatever it is you're targeting to people who don't have very good ones. Uh, there are some costs to this, so there's always going to be some mistargeting. There will be relatively rich people who live in mud huts and there will be relatively poor people who don't, so there's going to be some mistargeting. One key advantage of this is that I can walk into a village and assess whether the rules have been followed because these things are objective. So if I hire someone and send them, tell them I want you to enroll people who live in a mud and thatch home, I can tell whether or not they've broken the rules. And this is one thing I've seen in my research, this is something that governments often get wrong. So it's very tempting to target on things that are harder to observe, like does this person own a cell phone or how much income do they earn. Essentially that hands over responsibility for the process to your employee because there's really no way to go back out and verify and see whether they followed the rules. And so when I find rampant corruption in India's targeting processes, it tends to be because those rules are very difficult to verify. So we want rules that are simple so that we can hold our employees accountable. We also want to be able to explain to people why they are or are not on the list in a way that's easy for them to understand. Right? So the rule shouldn't be too complicated. Uh, I should say something about the other approach. right? So the other common approach to targeting in developing countries is called uh, community-based targeting. There are different variants of this, but it will involve some sort of process where the community gets together and votes on who's poor or perhaps ranks people according to their poverty and then people below a threshold would be considered eligible. You can see some of the potential benefits of this. People in the village might have a better sense of who's poor and who's not. You can also see some of the potential costs. There might be a lot of horse trading. Local power brokers might have more influence over a process like this. One conversation we had which was really influential in our early development was with uh, Oxfam who had done a cash transfer pilot in Vietnam. They were really pleased with the results, with the outcomes. The one thing that they regretted was that they did have a vote and they said there was a lot of conflict and disagreement afterwards from people saying, well I voted for you, how come you didn't vote for me? Right? This was one of those decisions where we decided to take the responsibility on us and I'd say that our experience so far has been that people are sometimes upset but they're upset with us and not with their neighbors and that's the way we want it to be. Last step here on this slide, so we use a, a number of layers of auditing for security. So we send field staff to back check 100% of the households we've enrolled to make sure that they do in fact live in eligible houses and also to ask whether they had to pay a bribe. Right? Did somebody ask you for money to put you on the list? That's something we want to be very sensitive to. We have our senior staff audit a fraction of households themselves and then we can have our office staff call people and check on their experience using phones right, for those of them who own their own cell phone 
And I'll actually talk quite a bit more about that data in a bit. I think one of the most exciting things about this is, you know, it's great that you can send money to people who have cell phones, but it's also really great that you can call them, right? And you can ask them a lot of questions about their lives, about how the process is working, about what problems they might be having. The data are super rich, and it's very easy to start asking new questions if you guys think of something that we should be asking. Can you Facebook friend them? Is that they're not quite to that point yet, but, uh, but yeah, we're, we're working on it. We'd like to at least get SMS up and running. I think it would be fantastic to be able to send an SMS to the person you're giving to. Yeah. So how do you prevent richer people from moving into less expensive houses that can get Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, when, we, when we look at the outcome data so far, when we've gone back and audited these, there has been one case so far of a household that we felt was borderline ineligible. And it was someone who seemed like they had, were just temporarily living in a house, but really were just you know, there from the city for a couple of months. Right? So that's the one thing I'd worry about. So far, it's been you know, one case out of 500 or so, but it's something to keep an eye on. Last thing which I'm really excited about, so I'm not going to show you this today because we're still working on it, but you know, the satellite imagery we have of these regions is high resolution enough now that you can actually zoom into somebody's GPS coordinates and see what their roof is made out of. So you can tell from the color whether it's thatch or metal. So that's another way to check whether the rules are being followed. That's not paternalistic, yes. what you say. No, that's a check that people are following the rules. Right? It's a little creepy, it's a little big brother. -ish. So those, those were decided on by your staff? Is that right, these criteria for determining who's going to be part of the program and who's not? Those were decided by us. So how is that different from organizations who determine their beneficiaries in various and more ways? I mean, there don't seem to be any changes by themselves. So how is it not? So there are opinions on our staff, but the sorry, there's a there's there's a we have a opinion board member, but broadly speaking, I, I wouldn't claim to be innovating here. This, as I said, this is a fairly standard approach. Because this seems paternalistic, with that determination of where to find the most poor. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's paternalistic, but that determination of where to find the most poor, rather than asking them how they define themselves. So I I'd be really interested to hear, yeah, the way you go about it. So, you know, the goal here is simply to find people who... Well, no, I'm just saying, like, a community needs assessment is a pretty standard way that organizations go about determining needs in a community. And it seems like that's a step that you're skipping with this model. So there, I think we should distinguish between a needs assessment, right, and a targeting exercise. So this is simply a targeting exercise. It's determining who's going to get help, but not what's going to be done with the money. And you're entirely right that community-based targeting is one of two predominant approaches to targeting, to poverty targeting. Mm -hmm. And you know, I was trying to walk you through our thinking behind this. What are the trade-offs? What we've seen is the community-based targeting approach can have problems when people are upset that their neighbors didn't vote for them. It can be a source of conflict, and that was something we wanted to avoid. On the other hand, it's true, as you say, that, that the local community might have its own sense of what poverty means. And that might be different from the one we're picking up here when we define it based on what your house is built out of. So that's how I see the trade-offs. Yep. That's a good question. Yeah. Others? Well, are the forms of housing that you're targeting, are they held in low regard by the local population? I mean, how do you determine that? Oh, yeah, sure. Let me show you what they look like. And, and also, when we talk about what people use money for, we'll talk about exactly that. So this is an eligible house. It's built out of mud and thatch. These are the kinds of people that we're going to be giving to. This is another eligible house. Again, mud and thatch. Uh, a third eligible house, just to give you some sense of what the range looks like. This is an ineligible house because it has a metal roof. And you can see it has higher quality wall construction. Right? And this is uh, another ineligible house with a metal roof. This one actually doesn't look super great. Right? The walls are, are not fantastic. Right? The roof looks pretty new. This is a definitely ineligible house, right? Sort of the, at the high end of houses that we'd see when we go into a village. Just to give you a sense of, of what this means in practice, right? What these things actually look like. This is what enrollment looks like. This is collecting somebody's contact information and explaining to them what they should expect, right? How much they're going to get sent, how things are going to work. So let me give you some data on the performance of this process to date. So we're working in Rarieta District, which is in western Kenya, and uh, it's a region which, according to the, uh, the national data, is very poor. So about 70% of the region was below the national poverty line. 
those data were the best available we had when we decided to start working here. We have some newer data released in 2007 through Kenya's Open Data Initiative, so we'll be using that going forward, which is great. Um, in our first round of ident recipient identification, we've located 500, a bit over 500 people. We're also doing a fairly detailed impact evaluation study, and so from the baseline survey of that study, we get relatively rich information on these households. So that's where some of this data is going to be coming from. Uh, mean nominal daily per capita consumption in this group is around 65 cents per person per day. 18% uh, of these households in our sample report having enough food for tomorrow. And to give you some sense of how much bite that these targeting procedures give, eligible households earn about 17% less than those who live in homes with iron roofs and about 45% less than those who live in homes with cement walls, which tend to be the richest households in the village. So this process gives you some bite. It also costs more than, say, simply going in and enrolling everyone in a village. And so you should think about how you weigh those trade-offs, getting to a, tar a poorer population um, but spending more money to do it. We go back and audit, right? So when we've audited we've and, and also when we've called households to ask about the enrollment process, we found this one case of borderline eligibility, which I already mentioned. And we haven't had any reports yet of bribe demands from our staff, which we're pleased about. We have had a few reports of bribe demands from M-Pesa agents, a couple of people who reported having to pay sort of 10 rupees more than they were supposed to. So uh, M-Pesa in general is widely trusted and widely used in Kenya, but it's not perfect. And so we get data on that and we give that back to the M-Pesa folks as feedback. Yeah. Do you think that the, that bribery happens because like we see that uh, where the money is coming from, and then if you didn't show that, or like put it under a different name, mm -hmm. then it wouldn't happen, or that's just like it happens. That's a great question. Yeah, I don't know because you know for a lot of these people, we don't know about their experience when they get transfers from other sources. But it would be fun. We could send it from Paul Meehouse and see if that makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the alternative is, but do you have any qualms about using self-reported data? Of course. I mean, this kind of data, none at all. right? If I call and say, did you have to pay a bribe, if anything, the incentive is to overstate here. When I show you some of the other data, you should always take it with a grain of salt. You know, if a white person comes into a village and says, what are you doing with money, for example, you know, people have some sense of what white people like to hear. So you should take that in, into account. Right? The, the, the data that I tend to trust more on this are data that come from surveys that were done and made completely independent from the source of the money. So in a lot of the literature, for example, we'll have a government study, a government intervention that gives money to some people, and then a group of pointy-headed academics come in and do a survey. Those sources of data I tend to trust a lot more. And when we do our evaluation, we impose a really strict segregation between the two teams to make sure that they're, uh, they're not identified with each other. Yeah. Uh, now on item 2C, you list here households earning. Now in rural areas, what does earning mean with people? cultivating the land and not having any wage income. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So earnings are, are harder to measure than consumption, typically for people living in rural areas because they'll have so many sources, right? They might have some wage income, but they'll have a lot of self-employment income from different sources. So again, these are coming from a baseline survey where we try to capture all of those things. There's surely some noise in that, right? So you should take that into account when you look at the numbers. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the scope of effort required to identify these 537 people? It seems like a very, it seems like a fairly small number relative to like meet your ultimate intentions. I mean, it's not really serving the masses if you're only serving 537. Oh yeah. Well, the great thing about this is that there are enormous. Well, great and the sad thing is that there are enormous numbers of poor people. So this scales incredibly linearly, right? The, the ambition here is obviously to take this to millions of people, right? right? But as far as this initial effort, what was the amount of time, money, cost, et cetera, associated with identifying that platform? How scalable is it really? Yeah, yeah, it's all coming up. I mean, the bottom line is we're, we're on track to, to spend around 6% of total on the cost of identifying and transferring and send about 94% to the recipients. And that stuff scales linearly, right? So the third step that I want to drill into now is this transfer step where we send people money using M-Pesa. And so I want to walk you through uh, some of the design choices we made here. I think here's where there could be a lot of scope for experimentation and growth, and we're still learning. So sending money through using M-Pesa is sort of a no-brainer, and this was the, the big draw in starting in Kenya to begin with. And I've already given you some of these statistics on how widely used it is. One thing that I haven't talked about is security. So an interesting feature of M-Pesa is that when you register with a system, you need to have a national ID to do so. 
And so when we give someone a SIM card and ask them to register, in some cases they're going to have to go and get that national ID card first before they can register. The downside of that is that it may take them some time to get that. So there may be a delay before they can start getting a transfer. The upside is that when I go to the M-Pesa website and put in a cell phone number and say I want to send money to this person, before I finalize the transaction I get back the name to which that number has been registered. And that lets me check and see whether the name that's registered in the system is the same as the name that we have in our records from when we enrolled the household. So it's a really valuable extra layer uh, of security. This part scales really, really magically. We just send electronic payments in bulk. Literally, I sit on the floor of my living room once a month and I upload a spreadsheet into this website and I click go and thousands of dollars go out into rural Kenya. It's incredible. Right? It's amazing that we live in a world in which that is possible. It's just mind blowing. We're sending households a, a one-time transfer of $1,000 over the course of one to two years. The way to think about this is there are around five people in a household on average, so it's around $200 per person. And that's roughly like one year's budget. Remember, these guys are eating around 65 cents per person per day. So this is like one year's worth of consumption uh, transferred as, a, as an upfront wealth transfer. Uh, a bunch of thinking behind this, so just to, to drill in a little bit and give you a sense of where we came up with this. We calculated how much we'd need to give people, if they were to invest it, to take the people who are the poorest in the village, the guys who are eligible, and make them as rich as their least poor but ineligible neighbors. Right? To try to take that left tail of the distribution and bring it up closer to the middle. One other nice thing about this magnitude is it's similar to a lot of these other public schemes that have been evaluated extensively. So to the extent that we feel comfortable extrapolating across studies, you might feel a bit more comfortable when the transfers are of a similar magnitude. Gender is a really big deal in development, right? I mentioned earlier this study that found big returns for male and not for female micro-entrepreneurs. On the other hand, there are several studies that find bigger impacts on kids when cash was given to women than when it's given to men. So we're really interested in this. We don't think there's enough evidence yet. And so we're sending money either to the male or to the female head of the household. And that's randomized so that we can get a sense for our context, do men and women use money differently? And does that affect the way we think about who we should send money to? The other thing that we varied was the timing. When you think about whether it makes more sense to send mon people money all at once or in a stream of smaller payments, lots of interesting issues that come up, right? On the one hand, getting the money all at once could let you do something like buy a large asset, make some big lumpy investment that you couldn't do as easily with a stream of smaller payments. On the other hand, having a stream of small payments might give you a bit more time to think about what you want to do. It might be valuable to have that element of deliberation. Right? We really don't know what to expect here. So we're doing both, and we're also asking people what they would prefer if they had the choice. Was that your question? Yeah, yeah that's a great question, right? <laughs> a couple of... <laughs> yeah. I, I, no, it's amazing. All these things that you can sort of sit in your office and like rack your brains over, and then you can also just ask people, right? And it's so informative. I really like that question. Okay. This is what the process of collecting a transfer uh, would look like in a typical village. Your M-Pesa agent is typically a shopkeeper right, in the local village or maybe in the nearest town. And that's where you'd go to collect. So here's what we know about transfers to date. So we've transferred, this is actually slightly out of date. So we're in the middle of sending the first quarter of a million and we're, we're funded for the next quarter of a million which we'll start sending during 2012. Um, and we sent about half of that. As I said, this is a month out of date. So we have about, about half of that first wave of transfers. Recipients, by and large, are successfully collecting these transfers. So we ask people, do you have problems collecting? 8% um, of the people that we've asked have had some sort of problem, and it's typically a cash out. So these m agents do face a cash management issue, and so occasionally they won't have the cash on hand to meet a, a transfer request. And in that case, you'd have to come back another time to collect the money. The average travel time for people in our sample, 42 minutes, and the mean financial outlay on this travel, 82 cents. Right? So that's what it costs people in time and in dollars to go and collect the transfers. And then I mentioned earlier there have been two cases of people who reported being asked by the M-Pesa agent for an extra payment. Right? And so those are cases that we have to hand over to the M-Pesa system and let them police. The other thing we can do in these phone calls is look at some of the key outcome indicators that we care about in real time. I've alluded to this randomized controlled trial which is in the field. We're going to get detailed impact data from that. But a lot of the things you really care about here you can get just by calling people. Right? So one thing we do is we ask people how they use money. That's one I would take with a grain of salt. But interestingly, 
the uh, sort of the three most commonly reported uses are for food, for investments in housing, and I'll tell you more about that in a second, and then for school, school fees or school uniforms. The thing I found really interesting about housing, so food doesn't surprise me at all, right? There, we already know that only 18% of the people in our sample have enough food for tomorrow, so we're thrilled about that. And I've told you already about how to, you know, the relationship between food and long-term uh, development for kids. The iron thing really took us by surprise. So a lot of people report buying metal roofs for their homes, which is kind of weird because that's one of our targeting criteria. So I guess one thing that tells you is that they understand this is not conditional, right? Because they are buying things that make them ineligible. Yeah? Can I ask a question about the bigger picture of poverty reduction? Because, um, I mean, spending the money directly seems to make a lot of sense, but if they needed to buy, for example, food that is imported, and not produced on the local market, or if they need to bribe with the money some government officials for getting the kids into school, mm. does it? I mean, does it really make sense in, in the bigger picture of reducing poverty? Then uh, these things, I think, are all fantastic. So I think we've talked about food in detail. So you know, this is one that I think is easy to misread and say, you know, if you and I thought about us spending money on food, then it would be like you and me going out for dinner, right? In a setting where only 18% of households have enough for tomorrow, this is like kids getting the food they need to grow, right? And women getting the food they need to have healthy babies. So I'm super excited about that. Let me go talk through the, the metal roof thing, because that also speaks to your question and was one of the biggest surprises for us, right? There are some obvious benefits to a metal roof relative to thatch, right? The thatch is more likely to catch on fire. Um, bugs live in it. It's unhealthy. It can leak when it rains. You can get sick. All these things kind of make sense. The more interesting thing is we, we saw that so many people were, were using money on this. We looked at the price of a metal roof, which lasts for quite a long time, and a thatch roof, which lasts for about two years. And we said, what's the implied rate of return on a metal roof as opposed to thatch? And our best guess is, using local prices, it's somewhere in the 15 to 20% range. So it's actually a pretty good investment, right? 15 to 20%. It's interesting because if you looked at these households' gross income, how much are they taking home each year? You wouldn't see that. Right? That's exactly the kind of thing that cash transfers are supposed to do, right? to let people who understand the local context make investments that an outsider like myself wouldn't have been able to identify. So we thought that was fascinating. Yeah. Other stuff here is perhaps a bit more like the things that we typically get told about, right? like livestock or medical care, or things like that. These are the, the more standard investments. Right? Yeah. And it's just a quick clarification question. So uh, is each person only eligible for one cash transfer, like, ever? Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, they, it's not like purchasing an iron roof would disqualify them. Yeah. Okay. But they might not have understood that, in which case they might have decided not to invest in their homes. And given what they're telling us, it seems like that wasn't the case. One thing that we were super concerned about was conflict. So we asked people a number of questions, ranging from sort of relatively low-level things like arguments or tension to more serious issues like violence or theft. Right? So we've had about 15% of the people that we followed up with report some kind of tension or complaint within the village. Right? We've had one case where somebody reported that someone else's, part of someone else's transfer uh, was stolen, and just a few cases where people have reported tension within their own household. In the cases where there has been tension or complaints, right, and this is where I mentioned before that our approach to targeting, what we like about it is this tends to be directed back at us. Right? There are plenty of people who are upset that we didn't put them on the eligibility list. Right? And that's something that we, we can go back and think about. Is there a way that we can do this better and still maintain that objectivity, be very transparent about what the targeting process is? Right? But the good news is that people are upset with us and not with each other. Then we just ask people free form, what would you do differently? if you were us. This also surprised me. So the most common suggestion, more than twice as many people suggested that we should expand coverage to their neighbors as suggested that we should increase the amount we give to them, which was not at all what I was expecting. I think there's also a lesson there to be learned about targeting. Maybe we should think about a more inclusive approach. Maybe we should just go with entire villages at a time, because that's what our recipients are telling us they would do if they had the money. I thought that was a really interesting lesson. Yeah. What was the reaction from local government? So we talk to people when we go in and let them know this is what's going on. It's sort of a courtesy to the local government. Um, at a district level, people are generally thrilled. They say this is great. A lot of organizations come in here and talk and don't do anything. You guys are going to talk very little and do, do a lot, so that's great. 
Um, the one funny story we've had so far, we talked to some recipients who were approached by their village chief, and the village chief asked them for a donation of ground nuts, which was to be given back to give directly as a thank you gift. Um, so these guys saw through that and said no, which was good, because we're obviously not interested in ground nuts. But uh, that was the one attempt we saw by someone in the political system to sort of game the scheme a bit, which I thought was funny. Can I, uh, can I ask, what's the, I'm still trying to understand what's the, what's the theory behind this. Um, these are one-off donations to particular individuals. Is that correct? That's right. Um, and so, and these are the very poor people who are getting a one-off transfer to use that money as you choose. Now, what is the sort of development theory um, that this is a part of, I mean, apart from proving that this can be done, I don't, or that this is a, a test case and others can do so. Mm. But I'm just trying to see, given the extent of the poverty, the universe that you have here, mm -hmm. and this one-off donation that people can use, mm. cash transfer, mm -hmm. I mean, like remittances that take this all the time. Right. Mm. So I don't see the... What is the, the transformative in terms of, you know, of the poverty um, that this is a part of? Well, I would point you, I wouldn't think about it so much in terms of theory, right? I would point you back to the evidence slide. Just, you know, take everything. Just take all the raw data on how people use cash transfers and think about it that way. Start with that, right? Because when I think about transformative, right, you and I, we could come up with a theory about what transformative means and how to get there. The whole point, the way to think about cash transfers is that poor people also have ideas about what would be transformative. No, no, I, I understand all of that. I'm just saying in the context of Kenya, and even if you take a particular community mm. that you're going into, and you're making this number, and obviously it's a wonderful system, but I'm just trying to see what is the transformative logic of what you're doing. Well, there are two parts. I, I was focused on the part on the ground, and... I'm not sure whether you and I have converged on that part or still disagree. I'm not disagree. But, I'm yeah. but, but so part of it is, from the point of view of an individual household, what would really change life? What would be transformative for them? And there, we're taking a very hands-off approach, and we're saying we think that, on the whole, the recipient is going to have better ideas than we are. Now, the second part of it is looking at the sector, right? The picture I showed you at the beginning, how can this be transformative for the, for the nonprofit sector, right? And there, there's a second set of issues, right? The issues to do with efficiency and transparency, right? We think that this could completely change the way international philanthropy works. So in that sense, that's another sense in which we could think about transformative and a theory of change. But I'm not totally sure which one of those you're speaking to. When I think of transformative, I'm thinking of some capacity that you're building, mm. right? And so obviously showing how philanthropy can get money more directly to groups of people, that's understood. Mm -hmm. But obviously if you're justifying what you're doing, is because there's gonna be some kind of transformative given the scale of, mm -hmm. of what is there. Mm -hmm. And I don't see the linkage between what you're talking about here in a transformative process of poverty in these communities. Well, where, where is the capacity, what's being built? I mean, after you one individual, a group of individuals, you're finished, you go off to another. I mean, you can keep doing I, I, that. I couldn't agree with you more on the core principle, right? To me, the, 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 incredible, the, the important and the exciting thing about cash transfers is that that process, that capacity development, right, that's in the hands of the poor family. They get to determine what looks like capacity development. Does it mean investing in my kids through nutrition or schooling? Does it mean investing in my house? These are all interesting you know, and potentially exciting investments. And to me, this, so the, the idea behind this approach is not to say capacity isn't important, right? that the long term isn't important, but it's to say who defines what long term is and which capacities need to be developed. Is it us or is it them? That's the essence of the difference to me. Yeah. Uh, sort of uh, maybe, maybe a question to you. Um, if, um, so, so this, in a sense, looks like remittances to me. Mm -hmm. So would you say that remittances do not build any capacities or...? No, 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 I'm not, no, and this is why I'm saying that what I'm hearing is um, a system to increase the consumption of particular recipients for a specific period of time. This is what is, is this is. 
Now, if you have remittances from one family to another family, there could be a long period of time in which this is done, all right? And it's the actual projects that could be included. And with a lot of remittances nowadays, for example, where communities are moving behind remittances to family, to talking about actual projects that villages can get together and do. I'm not hearing any of that from this. I'm hearing individuals who... You, I, don't, you, I don't know, if when, but you, you must have not been with me for the evidence side, because we talked through a number of things that are not consumption, right, that are long-term impacts through different channels in different contexts, right? No one theory of change, but each household's theory of change, whether it's through investment in a business so that people are earning 100% rates of return five years down the road, like the Sri Lanka study, right? Whether it's kids attending school and not having to work, like the evidence from the South Africa Child Basic Support Grant, right? Whether it's improved maternal health, like the Uruguay study, so that fewer children are being born with low birth weight. These are all channels for long-term capacity development, but they're different in every setting because we didn't define them going in. The recipients define them. Were those examples of success in cash transfers, were those one-time um, transfers? Because the government examples are all ongoing. Like, they're, all, they're all capped after a certain number of years. All the, yeah, so it, the, the number of years and the total amount of the grant varies. Right? We could certainly do a, set up a system where instead of giving people money once, we give them money over a 10-year period or a 20-year period. That might be a really exciting thing to experiment with. Maybe that's what gives them the stability to experiment and to take on greater risks, something like that. So uh, yeah. I was wrong in understanding that the uh, uh, that the idea was to uh, to get the poorest uh, family up to the level of the the better family. On like if if you get a, a, a better roof comparable to the good roofs in the area, would that stop your project right there? So we don't condition whether people keep getting money on what they do with it. Right? So I've told you what people tell us they're doing with it, and in many cases it's a metal roof. But that doesn't influence our decision about whether or not to keep uh, sending money, right? Yeah. We have a fixed amount of money that we send them over a fixed period of time, and then we stop, and they do whatever they want with it. Right? And that's a, sort of a key difference between this and, and other more conditional programs, right, where there are some restrictions on how you use money, things like that. So you, you are basically leaving people to their own devices to uh, That's well put. To do what, whatever they mm -hmm. But wouldn't you say that they need some type of guidance? And that would be the probably transformation that the gentleman has Well, you know, we, we'd love to see evidence on guidance, right? You often hear organizations say, we're going to train people, so forth. There hasn't been any convincing evidence yet that these trainings are effective and increase people's long-term well-being. But, you know, if I see something that works, I'll get behind it. Yeah? I was going to say, it'd be interesting. Do you use anything else other than the roof structure? No. A structure? Just in terms of criteria? Because I was thinking, maybe it could be that like if you go into a town and say, "Hey, if you don't have a metal roof, you're poor," mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to say, "Oh, I'm going to buy a metal roof now," right? So if you said you don't have livestock, that's you're funny. Poor. Yeah. And well, you might see that. Oh, I'll buy livestock once I. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah, that could really, be driving it, your it, result. It, I don't it's know. interesting. It's an That'd interesting. That'd be like thought. a test for status. Like, <laughs> yeah, status. yeah, yeah. No, that's a nice thought. You know, so I mean, to be clear, it's not just the roof, but also the floor of the home and the walls. We haven't seen a lot moving on those things. Um, so, you know, my sense is that part of the reason this is a good indicator of poverty is that it is something that poor people really want, yeah. right? Just, you know, in the data. But I kind of like your thought as well. It's interesting. Yeah. Have you contrasted your results with any similar studies that did conditional transfers? Yeah, so this is a great question. And there's actually just recently been one good study on this from Malawi where they did conditional and unconditional transfers side by side. <coughs> And the bottom line from that study is both studies found amazing impacts on HIV infection rates for uh, sort of women in their teenage years, which is really exciting. Those seem to be the same, if anything, a little bit higher in the unconditional arm. And the reason for that is that the unconditional arm continued to affect girls even if they dropped out of school. Right? On school attendance, not surprisingly, that both arms had an effect, but the conditional has a bit, big, a bit larger effect. I'm not sure that those are statistically <coughs> distinguishable. But we need to know more about this because we're spending a lot on the conditions and we don't really know what we're getting.
before that. The other interesting part of this, too, now that you bring it up, so people, the, the Oportunidades, the progressive program in Mexico is very well known. JPAL, which I'm an, a, a member of, has recently put out this report saying that this is not a very cost-effective way of increasing school enrollment, okay? Because the, the amount you, you pay uh, relative to the number of increase, you know, so the increase in school attendance isn't very big. Um, the people who designed Progressa have said, this is crazy. They said the point of this was not to get more kids in school. The point was to find a politically saleable way to give money to poor people. And if you condition it on school enrollment, we can get it past voters in Mexico. If we didn't, we couldn't. Right? So when you evaluate conditional cash transfers, one thing to keep in mind is that there is a political dimension to these programs as well as an economic one. I saw some, yeah. Yeah, this sort of uh, piggybacks on the question on the uh, logic underlying the transfers. Um, do you have a sense of where you want to go to get to, for instance? Um, if there is a, you have a sense of, well, this is, the, this is supposed to be the end of the process, but this person needs to be kept on the program, or it's not yet the end, but then mm. someone has reached a point where it's no more useful for them to keep going on. And there's this other issue I have. I think when you are differentiating between the mm. traditional and the direct transfers, I think the language is a little bit uh, polemical, like one empowers uh, experts to decide for people and the other gives people direct points. You know. But I think even in the direct transfer, there's very much um, or the surveillance, you know, you have the people's number you can call and maybe you would do it, but in the hands of another mm -hmm. organization, it could be useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Yeah, so two very different questions. So let me speak to them both. I think the first one, I really like the way you put it, sort of what is the end goal? And for me, that sort of crystallizes the distinction between this approach and others, which is that you're right, right? We're not defining what success looks like for any recipient. We're letting them define it. So what does that end goal look like? It could be different for each household. So we can collect data and tell you how people use the money and where they went with it, but we aren't defining for them what that direction should be. And we should just be really frank about that. That is kind of the defining feature of this approach. Right? To your second question, I, I'm sympathetic to this concern. You know, I do a lot of work in India, and the Indian government is currently issuing everybody with biometric ID cards. And part of the idea is that they'd like to be able to better administer their social programs and keep track of who's who. There are a lot of privacy concerns around that. Right? The idea that the government has a lot of your information in a big database, that's potentially a bit scary. Right? So when we go out, we ask people for their permission. We explain to them what we're going to do. Um, I think the possibility that somebody less scrupulous could do something similar for less honorable intentions is, is a perfectly legitimate concern. Right? I think what we can do is continue to be very clear with people about how we're going to use their information. And when we call them, ask them for legitimate feedback. You know, not use it to gather, to pry and to ask things about their personal lives, but to ask how can we do better? How well is the process working for you? I mean, you know, if there, there's an agency like a pharmaceutical or one of the genetically modified organizations manufacturing genetically, but if I would then be like back a certain transfer and not necessarily with you, but then that could be used as a means for getting the kind of production of certain programs you know, which will work in the long term. Yeah. I've been amazed in India, you know, we work, we work on programs where the entire database of participants is publicly available online for anybody to go and get it, including us. It makes our lives easy as researchers, but it really raises some privacy concerns, doesn't it? And I think for people, you know, if you're in a society where the internet is a completely new thing, right, and the idea that, that personal information could be sitting on a computer somewhere and others would have access to it is very foreign, this is an issue, right? It's something that people need to understand. I, I, so I'm broadly speaking very sympathetic. Yeah. Uh, how can you make sure that uh, this system would not create dependency? Because this is uh, like giving giving them fish instead of the net. So we'll, uh, I'll, I'll speak to that in a couple of ways. I think the first thing to note is, you know, we have a decision to make whether to give people money on an ongoing basis or a one-off basis, and we've decided to do it on a one-off basis. So people understand this is a one-time transfer, and it's up to them to take it in a direction they want to go. It's not going to continue. Right? I think to this broader issue of the fish versus the net, right? This is language that we often use when we talk about charity. Right? We talk about you know, giving fish versus giving nets. 
When we look at the data, people buy a lot of nets, right? They make a lot of investments in their kids or in their homes or in livestock. There are lots of ways in which people buy a net. And they also buy, and they meet, meet some immediate needs as well, right? They might pay for health care for a sick relative, right? So to me, the question isn't fish versus nets. It's a question of who makes that decision. Is it me or is it the recipient, right? And our approach is that unless there's a clear argument that I can do it better than they can, then we should give them money and let them see which direction they take it in. Is it the way I've been thinking about it is, as this discussion is going, is going on, the fish versus net thing, is, is it similar to think about like in the United States we do stimulus packages where people are giving money and the fact that, or not giving money, it's not really push to them, but they, the fact that they would have money to go and spend will will uh, increase, by increasing consumption is going to increase economic activity and all that. Is it the same? Mm -hmm almost type of situation here too. You're giving people, and, and I know that's not, you're, you, you want yeah, them yeah. to invest in things and be empowered to make the choices to invest in things, but also can you think about it in that way and the fact that consumption is being Well, it's funny, isn't it? Because when we think about policy for America during a recession, we obsess over finding ways to give people money so they'll spend as much of po as possible as soon as they can, right? right? And when we spend money on development, we obsess over finding ways of making sure people save and invest and consume as little as possible, right? So in some sense, there is this contrast. But I think in another sense, you're totally right. So we've talked a lot about how individual people use money. I think that one of the most exciting and least understood aspects of raising people's income is the effect that has on the rest of the village, right? Does the local shop start to stock new products? Does a bus start to stop there that didn't used to stop there? Do prices go up, right? Does this have inflationary effects? That's one of the things that we're focused on assessing going forward. Right? I think that will be, there'll be some exciting learning to come out of that. Yeah. I'm thinking through like expansion, so this idea of kind of targeting. Can you look at any of the other like intersecting variables that would maybe expand from like that 537 to maybe 1,000 to make more people eligible but not basing it specifically on like how the homes are made up? So what are some of the other things that we can say? Yeah, so first, just numerically, we're, you know, we're all about we're going to go back and probably do the next 500 people um, soon, and the big constraint here is money, right? It's how much do we want to give people. I guess the other part of your question is rethinking the targeting rule. Are there ways to do better there? So what, what we're doing with the data we have are sort of looking at other household characteristics, other assets that might do an even better job right, of targeting poorer people. Um, and we're also thinking about what would happen if we just went to village level. Suppose we just chose the poorest villages and gave to everybody. That would be a way to be responsive to this suggestion that we've had from recipients that they'd really like to expand eligibility rather than shrink it. Do you think you start one more than the other? I'm still thinking. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, I think each one has pluses and negatives. Like, it has pluses and negatives. Um, yeah. Personally, I'd probably lean toward the circuit just because I think that mm -hmm. there's certain things, aspects of, so, okay, so I have a metal um, rooftop, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a much more useful. So obviously yeah, there are certain right. aspects I think will improve some of the outcomes that people are talking about as mm -hmm. far as, well, this is what longevity means, <coughs> making educational priority or making housing a priority or making something specific, saying, right. well, these are people that need the money to do specifically this, and hopefully they need to put something around that. Thank you. Yeah. How do people receive the cash transfers? Uh, reconcile like this infusion of cash. Like, is it something that they'll get burned, or like, what are, I mean, how does it make them feel? Like, in terms of like what responses you're getting? Yeah. So it's a good question. I'm not really sure the best way to capture these sort of sort of psychological and emotional reactions. So what I'll tell you, we're doing. So here, yeah, here's the RCT. So I can tell you. When we go out and do endline surveys, right, what things we'll be getting information on. So we're going to be getting a lot of standard living surveys, standards measurement surveys type stuff, consumption and income. Um, we're doing these validated well-being scales, which psychologists like to use. So these are standard measures of how stressed people feel, right? how depressed people feel, things like that. Uh, you know, I'm not totally sure what to make of these things as an economist. I guess it's just not my area of expertise, but they do have the advantage of being comparable across different studies. Another thing we're doing, which is a little different, is we're working with a guy who does some neurobiology to, uh, to measure cortisol in people's saliva. So cortisol is a stress hormone, right? Um, and, you know, the, he, he's an interesting guy. He's doing this for a bunch of different development interventions, including some insurance interventions. 
And uh, you know, I kind of like this because I think for me personally, I don't think that somebody's well-being can be summed up in any one number. But for me personally, if I had to pick a number, it might be my cortisol level. I think that would be a pretty good approximation of how happy, how well off I am at any point in time. So I, I kind of like that. You know, our goal here is to provide a rich set of indicators that people can kind of see a complete picture and then summarize, aggregate across that in, uh, in the way that makes most sense to them. Hey. Um, so when you look at the control villages and households, um, is that are those households that don't receive any sort of aid, or are you also doing like collecting data on how other types of donor money is being used in areas? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So you know, we, I I may have, I think I mentioned that the feedback we're getting from the local political system is that not too much else was going on, and that was partly by design. So we try to work in areas where. Um, there isn't a lot of other, you know, some areas get saturated, right, with NGOs. You have like 10 different organizations doing 10 different things. So we've tried to avoid that by design. Yeah. So, okay, yeah. so the reason I ask is um, I can understand the principle of not wanting to get the most data how you put in what interventions are given to people. But mm. if, there, if you're trying to get the most value out of each donor buck, then there are certain interventions that are relatively proven, quote proven, and are low cost, say things like chlorine tablets or water, mm -hmm. that it's widely available that it's and it's very cheap, but it's just not widely used or adopted by people. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to partner with people on the ground that are trying to like educating people and things like that, there could be a lot more value created in terms of outcomes. Yeah, you know, I think broadly speaking we're all, you know, research oriented. So we like to see data on things that seem effective. As I've said, I think I understand that biologically chlorine tablets are, uh, are pretty effective and a good approach. I haven't seen evidence of an intervention that taught people about chlorine tablets that was effective. But if I did, it was something I would, you know, I would check out. I should say, too, more broadly that there are a set of things that cash is obviously not a good substitute for. Right? If you think about something like infectious disease, say like bed nets. Right? A big part of the value of a bed net is not for you, it's for the rest of your community. So to me it seems like there's a very strong case for subsidizing things like bed nets or things like deworming medication, right, which we have great evidence on. This has big external impacts on the rest of your community. Right? Those are not things you'd want to replace with cash. Right? On the other hand, the hot thing right now in international nonprofit work is to go to a website and decide whether someone should get a duck or a chicken right? or a goat or a cow. Right? That's the sort of stuff that we're gunning for. Yeah. Um, I just want to know if you've thought at all about um, you know, allowing people some control over when they actually receive the payment. Mm -hmm. um, it's just because you know, a lot of the time, like, poverty cycles and traps can begin with like, an, a shock, say an yeah. illness or a death. Um, and that's when people need the money most. And, you know, will either go into debt or just fall into a poverty trap. And I just want to know when mm -hmm. you thought about people being able to actually say, well, this is when I really need the money. That's a great question. So two things. So first, we do ask people what they think about timing. And we've had much less response on that margin than we have on this extend eligibility. But we have had a couple of people who said that they think a lump sum would be better than a stream. right? The other thing that's sort of interesting about M-Pesa is that it is a kind of relatively safe savings technology. So if you wanted to, you could just leave your transfers on your phone and withdraw them later if you did have that negative health shock. Right? We haven't seen a lot of people doing that yet. It may be that as they get more comfortable with the system and they trust that their balances will actually stay there, more people will start doing that. And M-Pesa is working actively to link up their system with interest-bearing accounts at formal banks, which would make that relatively more attractive. Say a couple. You have like 10 minutes. This is great. We don't have to get to any of the other slides if the questions keep coming. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if, if you're producing all this rich data and all this innovation accounting where you're working, um, I mean, in the long scheme of things in development, a lot of the times these people are poor in the first place is not because they don't have cash, but it's, it's a policy problem. You know, why this area is poor, why you know, a certain area is more effective than another. So how does, how does your these metrics that you're coming up with, which robust as they may be, how are they going to get to the right hand so that you can have change from, from above as well as from below? I think, yeah, I think the problem there approach. are a lot of settings where the institutional framework really isn't in place for people to make good investments. Right? I mean, if you go to a place like Afghanistan where things are chaotic, where you may have a warlord coming in and seizing everything you own at any minute, that's not a setting where, you know, regardless of whether, what resources people have now, they don't have the opportunity to make good investments. Right? 
So this is a great approach for a place like Kenya where there is some, you know, some degree of institutional stability. And sure enough, we see when we give people money, they do invest in the future in various forms, right? Um, I wouldn't, you know, if I were to go to a place like Afghanistan, my first priority would be institution building. Yeah. yeah. Let me just take another attempt here because I'm still struggling with the logic. Um, I mean, you know, cash transfers, um, where people are given money with a specific, you know, here's money, the kid goes to school, you get the money, I can understand. Mm. The kid, or here's money, the kid is vaccination, you can see that. Mm. Or there's money that's normally um, transferred, and by getting it directly to people, you cut out a lot of the ways in which there could be leakage and so on. In fact, we had a program we were running on HIV AIDS in Nigeria yeah. with a lot of researchers. Yeah. And then we discovered that, in fact, by um, getting um, our researchers, field researchers, to open bank accounts mm. and transfer the money directly to them from the University of Baden to Toronto. Immediately that cut out a whole lot of stuff. Mm. So I can see, I mean, I'm still working on this. Yeah. Or if you take Nigeria now, yeah. and the government in Nigeria is exploring whether or not for the Delta region, or we all producing, maybe if we just give the people some of that oil income, yeah. you'll have a much better income, right? So each of those things I'm seeing the logic in terms of a, you know, a sort of process. Yeah. In terms of this, I'm still struggling um, because I can see it's a wonderful system. And for people, and let me just give you a, a sort of a thought piece. It, let's take Detroit. And suppose we, Detroit is, a, is depressed. Mm. And suppose we were to go and identify 50,000 people who are mm. the real bottom. Mm -hmm. And we were to give them each, you know, $500. Mm. Right? And work out whatever that is. We can get a grant, send that money to them. Yeah. At the end of the year, we can study and say, they've, they've spent money now for a whole number of value of things. Mm. What would we really, in terms of the logic of dealing with the problems of that, would we have done? I'm still not seeing Well, I'd love to do the study on Detroit that you mentioned. Because <laughs> okay. I think, as I said, we are you know, looking for an end result? What is the end result? Let me, let me come to that. Okay. Right? I, I just want to speak to the Detroit yeah, okay. point, because I think it's actually a really important one, which is that we know a lot about how people in developing countries use cash, and frankly, I think less about what that would look like in the US. So I don't get up and talk about Detroit, because I want to be frank about the fact that I don't know how people in Detroit would use money, right? Now, to this question of sort of, you know, what, how would we define success? Is that maybe, is that, is that a fair way? That's what your sum, synopsis okay. was. Is that a fair way of summarizing no, your question? I just want to know, what is this leading to beyond the fact that the people who are very poor will be able to use their, improve their consumption for a specific net period, after which they basically still continue because there's no increase in the capacity or other incomes and so on. Well, that's just not the evidence, right? The evidence is that incomes go up. The evidence is that children's education goes up, right? So that's, I don't know what else to tell you other than that's not what the data say. It's interesting, by the way, you mentioned Nigeria. So I was on the phone with a team from Nigeria from the government that wants to use conditional cash transfers to get people to come and give birth in health clinics the other day. And they were grappling with exactly the issue you raised, which is they just had not thought through the leakages. Right? They had just not thought through how we're going to make sure the system doesn't get corrupted. Right? So, yeah. Um, because donors like to imagine like that they're giving a buck to a person, yeah. have you found any kind of problem with receiving donations to say, give us your money and we can't tell you what's going to happen to it? Well, it's, it's, it's a real, it really challenges people's paradigms. Right? So I have a lot of conversations with people that are exactly about this. Um, we've met some people in the process of starting this who are thrilled. They say, this is exactly what I've been looking for. And we meet a lot of people who say, I don't understand, you know, the whole, the whole point of the cow is that it's an asset and it's going to have long-term impact. And then we talk about how people, poor people use money, and the kinds of long-term impact that they seek out, and how those might be different from the things we had envisioned for them, and you know, who should be making those policies. So are your donors mostly corporations, or the individuals, or who is funding them? They're individuals. Initially, it was us. So we're probably the first 100K or so of this out of our own pockets. And then we put up a website. And it's weird. You put up a website, people come to it and start giving. And so we're still in the process of getting to know those people. It's interesting to figure out what sort of person comes to a website like this and just sends money to Kenya. You know, you know we're, we're talking about doing things in Detroit or in the third world. Yeah. But there are two examples of direct cash benefits that really affect all of us. Mm. The Genius Grants, mm. where people are highly motivated to be doing what they do, 
It's a straight out grant. Yeah. They can do anything they want to with it. What do they do? They do more of what they were doing. Exactly. It's amazing. amazing. I was talking with Dan Sokoloff today yeah. about this, and I had never thought of the parallels between the two. But Another example striking. is a university student, if they could get a grant for education, mm. they're highly motivated to get their education. They're going to use it for that purpose. Mm. It's really the motivation and the focus. So you, what you have people here is they're focused on improving their status it's their condition of living in some way. Mm -hmm. So you're giving them a grant and letting them make that choice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these are larger things in the West, but it really is the same philosophy. I think there is a strong parallel. I was going to say there's a third one, though. When you walk to CVS, there'll be a guy asking for a yeah, cash transfer. That's right. I mean, how do you, like... Mm -hmm. I grapple with that. A lot of us do, right? Let me share something a little bit personal with you guys. So I have a close family member who's a heroin addict and asks me for money all the time. And I don't give him money, right? So I'll be completely upfront with you guys. I think there are people who, for whatever reason, maybe because of a mental health issue or maybe because of a substance abuse problem, are not in a great situation to manage their own budget, right? That's kind of obvious, right? For us, the, bottom, the basic question is, is that the right way to think about the average poor person in Kenya? And to me, the data say that it's not. Yeah. Uh, this question has been sort of asked from mm -hmm. earlier, but um, are you looking in subsequent transfers and for some communities, and uh, not join the actual cash transfer because you know you say you want the communities to decide them. For some poor communities, what they want is the thing they can't provide themselves with roads, mm. which would make it easier to transport their produce from the farm and get better prices mm. or schools so that their children won't have to work for longer periods, uh, lo uh, to work longer to school. So, do you have cases where you actually do something in the community rather than give people money? It's a, so this is a great question. We, it's something we thought a lot about whether, let me just say, thank you for your questions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Enjoyed. Um, there are a set of issues, I think, sort of issues that are sort of community level. I think that's kind of the, the point your question raises, things like a school or a road or maybe some other project that would sort of affect the entire community. And as I mentioned earlier, we think that just giving money to individual people isn't probably the best way to address those larger collective problems, right? One thing we have thought about is, is this something you could, you know, could you give money to a community and say, you decide on a group project? A sort of community grant approach is something that people have talked about. And we think it's interesting. You know, I think the trade-offs there are, there's the potential for something like that to be captured by the powerful and the rich within the village, divert it towards something they want. But I think it's, it's worth looking into. I mean, you, yeah. you are directly involved in the process, so you don't give the money to the community. You find out what they want to do and you actually Mm -hmm. See it done rather than mm -hmm. give the money and let the community. Yeah, I mean, we'd be receptive to the approach. Right? The key question is if we gave money to the community and asked them how to use it, would we be able to deliver the things that they want? That's the question I would ask myself. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for any more questions, but I hope that you guys will agree that was a really interesting talk and please join me in thank you.